Hey, it's me, Chris, again, with part three of my series on why I'm an anarchist and not a Marxist. This time I'm wading into an old debate on how to go from the capitalist, imperialist, white supremacist patriarchy of today to the communist society of tomorrow. One of Marx's ideas that gets mangled out of recognition from its original form is the dictatorship of the proletariat. The idea was, you got rid of the ruling class, then the working class as a whole becomes the new government. Today we're looking at this idea in theory and practice, at least a little, and to see if we can't improve on it. First, what's meant by dictatorship? Well, nowadays the word tends to mean a state that allows no opposition or criticism. Depending whom you ask, Marxists consider places like the USSR, Cuba, Vietnam, or possibly North Korea successful examples of their philosophy, all of which have been called dictatorships. Is there any reason to believe they're dictatorships of the entire working class? Not that I can find. They're states. States can only ever be controlled by a tiny minority of the population. They claim to represent the workers and work for the people, but so do all states. Their legitimacy, and therefore to a great extent their power, rests on propaganda. You can put together all the workers' councils and Soviets you like, but if the people who control the means of force have final say, they don't have to listen to anybody else. But the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat, or DOP, let's say, was not always just to form another oppressive state. As early as 1843, Marx expressed support for a public able to deliberate and decide on public affairs for themselves. We see a reappearance of the themes of his critique of Hegel direct democracy through responsible delegates, the elimination of bureaucracy, and its attendant mysteries. Hmm? Sounds a lot better than what we have now, at least. Marx and Engels put a new spin on the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat after they saw the Paris Commune. They thought the old state form could be abolished with the right organization. They said the Commune did away with the state hierarchy altogether, and replaced the haughtiest masters of the people by always removable servants acting continuously under public supervision. The commune challenged the delusion as if administration and political governing were mysteries, transcendent functions only to be trusted to the hands of a trained caste. The communards' seizing of power was to be the transitional phase of socialism, which would lead to a classless society. Let me read this paragraph. A little-known text by Marx, his 1874 Notes on Bakunin's Statehood and Anarchy, explains the concept of proletarian dictatorship more clearly than any other. In his book, Bakunin ridicules Marx's concept of the transitional state power of the proletarian dictatorship, and Marx critically responds in his notes. Bakunin writes, If there's a state, then there's domination and consequent slavery. A state without slavery, open or camouflaged, is inconceivable. That is why we're enemies of the state. What does it mean, the proletariat raised to a governing class? Marx responds, It means that the proletariat, instead of fighting in individual instances against the economically privileged classes, has gained sufficient strength and organization to use general means of coercion in its struggle against them. Okay, that sounds good. I'm... I'm I'm there, I'm behind it so far. But it can only make use of such economic means as abolish its own character as wage laborer and hence as a class. When its victory is complete, its rule too is therefore at an end, since its class character will have disappeared. Well, it can only abolish itself as a class by abolishing both capitalism and the state. The state is what divides us into classes and legally requires us to use money for everything. They could always seize spaces and defend them from the state, like the Paris Commune, which is like abolishing the state for that territory. 
But unfortunately, holding territory is not always the greatest strategy. In practice, it tends to lead to either just another dictatorship, or else to being overrun when the state makes the counter-revolution, also like in Paris. The claim that after its victory has ended, its class character will have changed and it can abolish itself is a little suspect. It could, but I think it, that would only be true if it doesn't seize state power, if the proletariat doesn't try to just take over the state. If the working class reorders society through expropriation, local councils, etc., great. If it takes over the state or creates a new one, it'll settle in and a few dictators will rise to the top and it'll become permanent. When the Communards destroyed the central power and did not immediately attempt to reconstitute the state, Marx thought they would develop their own government, radically different from any that had existed before. There were to be delegates that could only do what they'd been directly authorized by their constituents to do. The commune was to be a working, not a parliamentary body, executive and legislative at the same time. The delegates were generally to be responsible for carrying out legislative decisions instead of simply voting on them. But in Marx's conception, things would still be centralized with professional administrators. When you centralize power, you're necessarily taking it out of the hands of locals. A lot of Marxists today tell me a Marxist or worker state is different. Then they proceed to praise China, the USSR, and other states that could not possibly be described as run by the entire proletariat. I lose faith in socialism every time I talk to socialists. And perhaps they're following in Marx's footsteps. On the one hand, it has been argued that Marx belongs among anarchist philosophers for his contributions. No doubt he's influenced anarchist and other libertarian socialist thought. Ultimately, we want the same things. On the other hand, Marx and Engels could never quite get beyond the need for centralized organization and planning, at least until the transition to communism was complete. Some kind of centrally coordinated decision-making might be useful if they form what Bakunin called a confederation of confederations, but only on issues that actually need to be coordinated on a wide scale. There aren't actually many things that need to be done in groups of hundreds of thousands of people or require permanent committees. In the absence of a state that introduces violence and control into every aspect of life, people would organize in various configurations. But they wouldn't need to replicate the core functions of the modern state. They don't need to centralize decision-making or the means of self-defense, for example. Whenever things are centralized, you're reverting to the old state, just with new people at the top. I don't think it helps to think of the working class as the class that will form the dictatorship of the proletariat. We're talking about a huge portion of the people. We'll never get an entire class to agree with us. How would you unite the whole working class? Marx said the working class alone would guide the transition to communism. But what about reactionary elements? They would still probably have disproportionate say. Wouldn't they also have candidates and delegates and access to central decision-making? Or would you just kill or imprison all reactionaries? Because anybody could have a revolution by killing all the bad people. But does that really lead to liberation? My guess is it would lead to centralizing force and establishing a new hierarchy. Whatever Marx and Engels intended, most Marxists today, or at least the ones you meet online or in academia, think of the DOP as a powerful state that, they assume, will let go of power one day. It's temporary, until such time that the proletariat abolishes classes altogether. 
Some of them say it's a totally different kind of governance from the bourgeois state. And then they tell me all the ways it's the same as other states, like councils, input from the people, votes, representatives you can recall, just like we learned about democracy at school. And like liberal democracy, what the people want under a socialist state gets vetoed by people higher up. So they don't usually ask. We've seen the history of these states. Why would you support them? When have they done things differently? And I don't think universal health care can count when capitalist states have that too now. It's still workers working all day for wages who make it all possible. When have these states lived or encouraged any communist values, like worker self-management or eliminating the need for money? Neither Lenin nor any Leninist state since him has attempted to do things like Marx laid out in the Civil War in France, nor any other fashion that would lead to the liberation of the masses. Their states, like all states, quickly became a monopoly on force and governance over the territory they claimed. Building large parties that will govern for the people this time is not a viable strategy for implementing communism. Communist parties get pushed to the margins, despite spending all the time and money it costs to contest elections. I thought the history of Germany's Social Democratic Party between the Commune and World War I had taught us elections and parliaments would not lead to the revolution. And yet, here is the DSA today. That's not what fighting back looks like. It's supporting and legitimizing the system in the belief you can steer it in a better direction. I have seen very little historical evidence this is possible. I'm not an expert on Marx. Zoe Baker is the resident anarchist expert on Marx. But I don't think he would want people in the 21st century to be citing him as if his words were immortal. Stalin, well, he probably would. But one thing M and E said that still holds true is in the Communist Manifesto. The bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production, and thereby the relations of production, and with them the whole relations of society. So we need to update our theories to keep up. What Lenin and Mao said about imperialism and the international system and what's to be done are largely obsolete. And yet they're held up by some Marxists as the only people you need to read for everything. The tradition of dead generations weighs like a nightmare on today's left. This tweet I just saw really resonated. Truly believe the primary contradiction of the U.S. left will prove to be how to avoid their own complete irrelevance, despite the unstoppable urge to alienate block after block of non-U.S. proletarians with their statist apologism. If the DOP is a state, and the goal of the left is to control the state, it will not liberate anyone. But if you were to sweep away the state, the people could organize freely. Where the state is absent, people are doing the work they think they should do. They don't ask the state to do the things it claims to do for them, or guarantee their right to do the things they were going to do anyway. But there's so much that desperately needs to be done, and we can't do it because it's illegal. There are millions of people who would gladly stop the destruction of the environment, for example. They are held back by the state. The state monopolizes the making of such decisions, of which use of force is allowed and which is not. And if the state decides the environment can suffer a bit more, you'd have to have a revolt just to defend nature, just like we do now. But we don't need a state, and we don't need a party to lead the revolution. The DOP would only work toward communism in the absence of a state. You know another part I like from the manifesto? In place of the old bourgeois society with its classes and class antagonisms, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all.
The thing about using the state to abolish the state is you're trying to use the master's tools to dismantle the master's house. I think we need to get past the idea that some small group needs to be in charge. Who's to say which people should be in charge of what and have which powers over us? Unless it's precisely what the people affected by it want, it can become tyranny. I should mention at this point, one common dispute among leftists regards what to do with reactionaries. Like, you know, people who spread racism, or people who try to own everything. I would refer you to my philosophy. Remember this one? This video? Did you see it? Well, you might already agree. If you're being a dick, like by taking away resources from people who need them, or spreading bigotry, and trying to get people hurt, then the rest of us should have the freedom to do something about it. If the DOP is just the absence of a central state, people can do something about those people being dicks. They would be free to stop reactionaries in their attempts to re-enslave people or whatever they would do in this hypothetical. That wouldn't necessarily mean violence. I mean, it might, but not necessarily. If coercion becomes necessary, it doesn't necessarily have to mean killing people or putting them in cages. It might just mean turning their mansions into libraries and making them live in a house that's big enough for them like everyone else will get. It depends on the person, what they've done, if they have a chance of changing, that doesn't mean we need permanent prisons and prison guards and executioners. Let me read just a bit from the book Direct Struggle Against Capital, which is a great book for answering your questions about revolution without a state. As well as causing the rise of reformism within the labor movement, Marxism also failed to understand that the modern state could not be utilized to create socialism. As Kropotkin stressed, one does not make an historical institution follow in the direction to which one points. That is in the opposite direction to the one it has taken over the centuries. To expect this would be a sad and tragic mistake, simply because the old machine, the old organization, was slowly developed in the course of history to crush freedom, to crush the individual, to establish oppression on a legal basis, to create monopolists, to lead minds astray by accustoming them to servitude. It is the greatest hindrance to the birth of a society based on equality and liberty, as well as the historic means designed to prevent this blossoming. A social revolution needs new non-statist forms of social organization to succeed. To give full scope to socialism entails rebuilding from top to bottom a society dominated by the narrow individualism of the shopkeeper. It's a question of completely reshaping all relationships, in every street, in every hamlet, in every group of men gathered around a factory or along a section of the railway line. The creative, constructive, and organizational spirit must be awakened in order to rebuild life. In the factory, in the village, in the store, in production, and in distribution of supplies. All relations between individuals and great centers of population have to be made all over again, from the very day, from the very moment one alters the existing commercial or administrative organization. And they expect this immense task, requiring the free expression of popular genius, to be carried out within the framework of the state and the pyramidal organization which is the essence of the state. They expect the state to become the lever for the accomplishment of this immense transformation. They want to direct the renewal of a society by means of decrees and electoral majorities. How ridiculous! So I guess the question is, how can we carry out a revolution and how can it be defended without a state? A strategy anarchists use is prefiguration. Think of prefiguration as building the new world in the shell of the old. It's preparing for revolution by making people self-sufficient, self-educated, and capable of self-defense. I don't want to go into a lot of detail here because there are some videos by other people that take way more time than I do to make their videos, so I'm linking them in the description, like always, along with a couple of essays on how to defend a society without the state. There are probably lots more out there like this if you want to look for them. 
abolitionists nowadays focus on police and prisons, but they don't say only get rid of those things and then don't do anything else. They organize to provide what the state claims to provide but doesn't really have to. They do or try to do what they would be able to do freely in the absence of police, like physical or mental health care or, wait, wait, let me get a book. Plus, redirect the billions that now go to police departments toward providing health care, housing, education, and good jobs. Uh, trained community care workers doing mental health checks if someone needs help. Towns using restorative justice models instead of throwing people in prison. It's all mapped out for us already. You know, building solidarity, equality, community whatever you want to call it. This is the movement we should be a part of. It's a movement led by the people most affected by it, like black people. Same with the land back movement, activity in line with communist values, but not led by white people. There's no need to try every few years to build a vanguard party from the bottom up. The organizations and organizers already exist. You can start by joining them. Thanks.